and I'm going to bring out um, the creative team behind Murder at the End of the World. And let's see who we have first, Britt Marlene. I suppose I should also say your credit, co-screenwriter, co-director, creator, <laughs> that EP, what, what else are we missing? Um, lots of them. Um, okay, first, because this, I think we've kind of been talking about um, in the back that because of the timing of the when the show, the show came out, that you guys have not been able to do a ton of this together. So I'm really curious, especially because we have a room full of adoring people who've just seen the first episode, what is everyone's, what is your comfort level with like receiving praise about about your work? My comfort level is never high. For for some reason, I find the praise more challenging than constructive criticism. Usually, when we put something out, I'm always like, okay, who? What were the most interest? What was the most interesting critique of it? You know, like how can we do better next time? But at the same time, it's also been really beautiful to see people find Darby to be an, an, an Emma's performance, you know, so iconic and original and, and a standout new version of a detective. So that's pretty been pretty exciting. Yeah, I think the same. I think I'm normally quite, I struggle with say, the Britishness of sort of accepting praise. It's terrifying. But um, uh, I think with this one, with the show in particular, um, because of the sort of huge ensemble effort it was to make it and we were all together we lived and breathed it together for the best part of a year through like two countries and multiple places and i feel like we grew so much together and it was such a huge effort to make it and so much went into it and so actually i think it really deserves all the, all the praise and that's not for me but just for everyone i really feel like yeah it deserves i'm really proud of it <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. It's hard to take um, any of it, really. That's why I think we work in a medium uh, where, you know, Britt and I started working on this idea in 2019, and um, a friend of ours who's in tech um, said, well, you can't make the guy an AI designer, because we were trying to find a, a job for Andy that would be kind of like cutting edge. and." Um, they were like, no, AI designer, that's so far away. It's so Hollywood. <laughs> and Brynn and I went and spent like a week thinking about it and talking to each other. And then we were like, no, we feel like AI is important. Like, it, otherwise it's cliche if the guy's like social media or something like that. And then you start this journey and then we meet Emma and Emma becomes Darby. And they did, you know, they worked so hard. Like. We, they were saying like we all lived and breathed this thing, but Emma's in every single scene. It's completely from their POV. And so you do all this, but you do it kind of in the dark and in a cocoon, and then the butterfly is not yours. You know, so the praise is not yours and the criticism's not yours. It's all of yours and um, you know, the audiences. It's kind of a cool thing in working in long format in TV, is that you make these things, but the butterflies just go out into the world. And, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about um, the experience of writing for and then directing a lead character that this time around is not played by Brit, and what, if anything, surprised you about that experience, or if there's a way that you can like tangibly point to how the character of Darby changed or, or grew because of um, because of having Emma, if you'll permit us <laughs> to talk about you while you're right here. <laughs> God, yeah, it, it's interesting because when we finished OA, I really felt I wanted to direct. And But while we were making OA, it was so ambitious in its scope. And we were trying to realize it on such a narrow budget that it was just impossible to be the lead and also direct in the way that I would have wanted to. So when we set this project up from the beginning, I was like, I would like to take a step back as an actor to make the space to really direct. And I'm so glad I did that. And we were writing Darby, and we never write with actors in mind. Even when we're writing, thinking of me, we don't really think of me. We, we really think about the character. And when we finished writing the scripts, this was inside the pandemic we were doing this, we did it kind of feverishly and it was intense, and we were working with John Landgraf and Gina Bailey on it, and they're such incredible story editors. They would give amazing notes, and we'd really take these drafts apart and rewrite them in a way we had never done before. I mean, 
close final draft documents, never open them again, start a new blank page. We did that two or three times on the middle chapters. I mean, by the end of it, I was like, I'm, I'm never writing again. Um, but when we finished, we would give the scripts out and the scripts, people had this very cool reaction, which is they would, they would read it and they'd be like, wow, Darby, you know, this Darby seems like this character we haven't seen before. And it had all this weight that we got so nervous to then cast Darby. We were like, who can pull this off? I mean, it's, it's all saying this person's in every scene. It's emotionally very intense what they're going through. It's also physically incredibly demanding. You're talking about like scaling down canyons of ice in Iceland and, you know, crossing the desert and heat, all this, all this stuff. Um, and then we met Emma on Zoom and it was an amazing experience because the time we finished the Zoom, we hung up and I called Zala after and I was like, that I, like, I felt no pressure anymore. I just knew that this person could take on the role so completely and bring even more to it. The, have all the gravitas and the depth and the wisdom beyond her years that Darby has. But also Emma, I think as a person who brings this to, to the role, uh, like a lightness of spirit, like you want Darby to win, you know, like you, you believe in her and you, you want Darby to win. And so every day watching Emma work was just, such a pleasure because they brought things to the role that we didn't even know was inside it and always made it better than it was on the page. So it was an amazing experience. And we got, we got lucky. Yeah. Yeah, that's, a, that's a really good point. There is, there's a version of the character that could be maybe more antagonistic as opposed to boundary pushing, but a lightness of spirit. And I think that's, that's really interesting. Um, Emma, and I know that Britt, you've talked about in the past, like um, having a hard time finding roles for yourself that feel like whole and fully realized and like strong and empowering. And Emma, I'm curious, like where, where were you at in your career and looking for roles when this came to you? And like, do you find that they, because from the outside, if one were to just look at your IMDb, it seems like you don't have trouble finding like really good, strong, fully realized roles. But of course, there's a whole, you know, element of, that goes on um, that we don't know about. But yeah, kind of what were you, what were you looking for in in the next job, and what was it about this one that kind of fit that? I think um, at that point, I was um, I should really remember exactly where I was sitting when I read the first script because it was such a monumental moment because I just couldn't put it down. I was in the makeup tests for Lady Chatterley's Lover, and we were in this sort of random house in Wales, and I was sort of getting this wig put on, which takes hours, and I thought this is a great time to read the script I've been sent, and I just like time passed, and I'm normally quite a distracted, <laughs> very distracted person, and my attention's sort of everywhere, so for something to really consume me and for me to not even notice time passing was, I was just like, wow, I was sucked into this world, and especially to have that happen at the hands of a like female protagonist um, who felt really unexpected as every page turned. And I found her really endearing, but quite hard to decipher, which I really liked as well, that kind of element of I don't, you can never quite catch this person um, because I think she's still finding herself so much as we follow her through the story. And yeah, I think at that point, I, it, it came at a really wonderful time because I really wanted to do something modern, something different, um, and it was all of those things, yeah. Um, it, and like saying that it's modern, I think this is something um, that you and I talked about when, when I interviewed you, is that there's an element of this show that feels a little bit ambiguous in its timing, um, in its, and I think that goes to just the whole mood and vibe, but where you're like, like I think the, the what brought what I realized was when um, Harris's character was um, when you were looking it was like too much of the phones and he was like very upset and walked into the desert and there was this kind of whole discussion of like how much are we how much are we living in here and how much are we living out here and I was like wait oh that's that's actually current day it's not this kind of ambiguous thing but I'm wondering if you guys can talk about I guess just creating the I hate to use vibe as a as a term but like. Create the, a the very about. specific kind of like mood um, and the feeling that you have of watching this show that's very different from a traditional murder mystery feeling that you have. Well, I think that, um, you know, it's like all part of it. 
you know, like sometimes you'll cook broccoli and you just use this, <laughs> the, the, the heads, the broccoli heads. And um, a, lot of, a lot of TV shows are like that, or like movies are like that. They just want the heads and they throw out the stem. But I think that Britt and I really believe in kind of a method way of working. And so all of it is part of it. Like we had, like we were in Iceland and it was really hard. And there were like storms and we were all in different hotels and we were isolated and we had all these delays. And you know, like we really felt like we were at a retreat that was snowed in. And so then we came and- I know we were all gonna die. <laughs> Well, Britt was in the hospital with hypothermia, so like it was really scary. And we were all just getting to know each other then. And so you're trying to sort of build trust, but it's all new and the pandemic is surging and you don't know what to do and you feel kind of isolated. And then we built the hotel that you guys saw at the end there um, is a two floor uh, set that Alex DiGirlando designed and executed. And it's really beautiful. And so then but it's between three trash dumps in Jersey City. <laughs> so it was like a new soundstage. We got like a deal on it and they just put like, Jersey doesn't have the restrictions California or New York has. So they just put like some paint over the landfill and we built this thing. And so and if you left the soundstage doors open, the smell of trash would just waft through this dazzling <laughs> hotel that you're yeah, in. I would, I would run around and be like, close the bay doors so we don't get cancer. No, but like, but like Emma, like I was so excited to invite Emma to New York that had never been to come work in New York and they're doing like these crazy hours in this trash, three trash dumps. And so we shoot that for like three months and then all of a sudden we take like a few weeks off and we all reunite in Utah and we've shed most of the crew and we're feather light, like handheld and Emma and Harris are just in that car and the sun is shining and it like you really felt the vibe like so we were living it and so and it was the first time we could see each other's faces because it was the first part of the shoot where we hadn't all been wearing masks and that really changed everything because we like, were outside we've been on this through this ordeal together and then for the last like two weeks finally we could see each other's smile and it was it was an incredible experience and i think you're right the feeling of making it entered the scenes themselves and gave them that kind of time out of time quality of first love. Yeah, we were so ready for that new context at that time in the shoot. And it really like worked with the nostalgia of Ben and Darby's storyline, the atmosphere out there. The fact that it was like Iceland, but without snow, you had these like vast landscapes. Remember you, didn't you say it was like the moon? They're both kind of like versions of the moon, one covered in white and one completely sandy. And, but they both, both have this vastness that you can get lost in them. Um, it was amazing out there. Yeah, but New York, the trash dumps in New York, it was so funny. I went, I recently got asked to do one of these um, press things where it's like, oh, can you do this interview about, it was like Condé Nast Traveler or something, can you do this interview about your like top five places in New York? And I was like, I couldn't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> they were like, but you were there for, like this was in, in that sort of partnership with this show and they were like, you know, you were there for, you know, six months. I was like, yeah, I was in, <laughs> in New Jersey. <laughs> Sandwich <laughs> between three yeah. towns. <laughs> I didn't do because it was yeah it was every day. We almost worked six day weeks because of the like um, the turnaround. So it was yeah. I lived and breathed it. Breathed it. So were you gonna say something? I cut you off. No no, 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 not at all. No, I was just saying that you you'd asked the really great question about like we'd always written these stories, these ambitious stories, and then Britt would play the lead character. So there was this like inherent trust, and it was amazing to work with someone new because. That trust isn't there, you have to earn that trust. And by the time we get to Utah, it's like, I wanna now make a show with Emma again, because like we, you, you, you get to know people really deeply actually. And as an actor, you get to see the, Darby was coming to life. You know, it was really important. Um, Britt and I were looking at, in 2019, at Murder Mysteries. And we were looking at, um, when you look at them, like four of them in a day, you get really overwhelmed by the fact that they all begin with the death of this young, beautiful woman, usually naked, and that that death powers the entire story. And when you watch four of them in a day and then another four the next day, you're kind of overwhelmed and horrified. And at the end of the second day, Britt was like, you know, what if we just like lift this girl up 
and give her life and clean her up and give her clothes because she's, you know, undoubtedly naked and invite her to solve the mystery. And then writing that actually proved to be really hard. That's why we, you know, with, with uh, John and Gina's help, we were trying to figure out how to write that character. But that's just 50% of it because then someone has to come and the Emma that I met when we first started shooting and the Emma that I see now, like you're also, evolved, like you're coming of age at the same time that Darby's coming of age and you're all coming of age in this new era where women are telling stories for the first time on screen. Like I don't think we understand how radical it is that in the last five years, women are writing and directing stories that, you know, when Brit, you were Emma's age, that just so, didn't exist. Yeah, to go back to how you started this question, when I came out of Sundance, you know, we had made these tiny movies for like under a hundred thousand dollars and then the magic of them both being programmed at Sundance and it was an incredible experience. When I came out of Sundance and I had an agent and a manager and all these things, but the scripts that came through, you know, high level scripts, working with movie stars, enormous budgets, the female roles at that time in 2011, 2012, 2013, it was like you were just there to ask a question that prompted a male monologue or you were there to like, you know, drop your clothes in the door and like walk in. I mean, the number of scripts that I got where it was just some aspect of the nudity was my was my basic purpose in the scene. And I was like, I can't do this. And I had been so excited to shuck off, you know, at the time I was like, I don't want to write, I really want to act. And then I realized, I was like, oh, I've got my foot in the door here, but there aren't, there aren't really any parts to play right now. And it, that moment, you know, a decade ago was really about women starting to be like, if we want to change the narrative, we got to rewrite it ourselves. And so it's interesting now, 10 years later, to be in a place where we're seeing those stories start to get funding and start to come to light. And, you know, the parts have, have really changed for young women. I think that's so exciting and such a testament to this community of storytellers, our ability to change and push things in new directions and let new voices in and all be inspired by each other to carry things forward rather than staying in the same old, same old. So. Yeah, I was, I was going to ask about like storytelling conventions essentially because I know what, what, what the two of you really became known for with the OA among a lot of things was the way that it kind of broke all this new ground and the way that you wrote that and the way that you directed it and you know it's an eight-hour movie and all that kind of stuff and I was going to ask if you even now looking back at murder if you feel like you're you're noticing any kind of conventions that you feel like you flipped on their head um like I think in this episode that everyone just watched you know it you have a really long opening sequence and it, you really don't know what the show is going to be for like a long a, a, a half the episode. Like, why are these guys singing Annie Lennox? Yeah, like, where's this gonna go? <laughs> yeah, but it's it's so beautiful and there's a really good payoff. But um, I, I guess you kind of also just answered the question, which is that you flipped the um, who would be solving the mystery and, and what would be but would the, be dead and all that kind of thing. That really, I, I don't think we realized when we had that exercise of watching all the murder mysteries. We're like, well, we'll just flip the age and gender, like no big deal. And then it wasn't until we started writing drafts and. I mean, I've never had this experience before. They just kept getting kicked back, and they were like, "We don't believe this. No, this doesn't work." And you're like, "Okay, gotta take a deep breath here. Like, nobody finds it possible that a woman in her early 20s, mid 20s, deserves to go toe to toe with the tech billionaire in a scene and win the scene. Or let's not even go there. Nobody believes that when that young woman knocks on the door of the hotel guest and wants to ask questions, that the hotel guest is going to answer. Why? So." We had to, we literally had to invent a structure to make it not Nancy Drew. And the structure we invented was like, okay, we're gonna tell this whole other story that's her coming of age story. And you're gonna see that she grew up, you know, the coroner's daughter in the Midwest and without a mother. And she was on crime scenes as a- That's chapter kid. two, by the way. It's chapter two, so stick with it, guys. It gets better. Um, <laughs> You know, daughter, the coroner's daughter, she's out there in crime scenes as an eight-year-old. She realizes when she comes on the crime scene as an eight-year-old that, you know, the detectives and the cops, and they're all up here, and she's down here with the body of the woman. And her coming-of-age moment is a realization that it is very likely that she'll come into contact with some kind of violence before she reaches that age. And that enters her and em empowers her, and she becomes this amateur sleuth and starts solving these cold cases of you know, Jane Doe's online, and that leads her to Bill, and we watch that whole journey. 
And we have to continuously tell that story, not as a flashback, but as a literal braided second story so that every time Darby's in a room in the present in Iceland, you're constantly justifying her reason for being there, that she's somebody who can speak with authority and can solve the puzzles and that it's not a farce or a stretch, but it it's real. And it wasn't something we realized when we thought about the gender switch. It's something we had to find in the writing because you didn't realize until you were writing it that you hadn't seen it before and, and believed it, you know, if that makes sense. If, yes, of course. And and of, of course, I love the final product and the way that it was weaved in. But it's, it, it's interesting. I feel like I come across just whenever you talk to people about a certain TV show or movie or book and there's a female protagonist who's maybe words people like to use are precocious or, or things like that. Oftentimes when they are pushing back against the person's personality, it says a lot more about the person who has the question about why is why is this young girl knocking on the door than it is like well why do we have to tell you, you know, <laughs> kind of things. Like it's you just figure it out or you, you wouldn't really ask that. No one's asking why why Fangs is is, you know, doing the kind of things he's doing. But yeah, yeah. Um, but I guess it means Which is what makes Emma's job so much harder than Harris's. Yes. I mean, Harris is an amazing actor, but like it made like what you were doing because you have to kind of constantly sell it to the audience. Did I guess we should I should ask quickly about, about Harris. Um, and we can embarrass him with flattery since he's not here. <laughs> um, what let's see, what's a good question to ask? What surprised any of you about working with him or something about um, him as, a, as an actor uh, that we might not know. So and or <laughs> is he more like Bill or Fangs? Mm. You can pick which. Is he more like, wait, which? Which is he more like? Oh God, that's such a good question. I see them so much as the same. Yeah, like it's such an organic. I guess just as you were saying, it's such a good point you made that you don't have to justify why Fangs is doing what he's doing because it's so, he, that, side of his life is so ingrained with the person he is and I think that that in a dream world would be what Darby is as well you don't have to question it it's just who she is um Harris is absolutely incredible I loved and it was so nice because I was there the entire time and um yeah it was a huge responsibility and I loved it to like lead that show but the days that he dropped in in New York and did a stint with us was so fun we have very like similar silly senses of humor and refused to take anything too seriously, which I really appreciated. It was nice because, as Zal was saying, we lived in this sort of two-story hotel and it was quite, it was a very much an ensemble cast. And I can remember us having a conversation about it one day being like, it really does feel like we're like trapped here. <laughs> like we haven't seen anyone done anything apart from live in this hotel. And it was kind of a very weird inadvertently method way of going about being trapped in this place. Um, and then Harris would drop in, it would be this like ray of light. And he's incredible. He's an amazing scene partner. He gives back so organically. And um, yeah, I don't know. It, it's, so, it's so true what you're saying about Harris. There's one moment in particular I remember the scene, um, it's in chapter six, where you, you find out what happens at the end of that sequence where they go down the basement stairs and they uncover the bones and they meet with this moment. and. Hair, we had to do that scene in a day, all versions of it, you know, so the going down the stairs, digging up the body, and then the ending thing, we had to do it all in a day. So everyone's covered in dust, and we jackhammered up concrete, and then it's clear the, the concrete. the beginning of the shoot. And like that. It was the beginning yeah. of the shoot, yeah. And uh, we had no time. So we were running at the end of the day, and we there's a moment where the, the killer basically shoots at them, and Harris's character, Bill, steps in front of Darby to, to protect her, and he thinks he's going to be shot. And we only had one chance to, to do it because once Harris was covered in blood, that was it. We were, it was the end of the day. There was no time to change. So I was like, Harris, no pressure, but we're only going to do this once. And he got up to do it. And it was one of the times I was behind the monitor and I was so worried about pulling this off. And he somehow dropped so deeply into it that when the gunshot went off, which was just like the AD like clapping two wood blocks together, oh. he really felt he'd been shot. And you felt it because it was biological. His throat, like something inside his throat was literally like went through a seizure and his whole neck was like trembling. And 
I thought, oh gosh, this is the mark of a really incredible actor is when it's not that you've planned what you're gonna do when you think you're gonna be shot and then you're not shot. It's like he was so deeply in the moment that his body was performing it, not his mind, but his, he had a visceral reaction to the feeling of being shot and then realizing that he was suddenly okay. And you could feel it all just in his like throat and neck and like what was happening there. So yeah, some, I think he has a, he's a really powerful performer and we were really lucky because Bill's not on screen often, but when he dropped in, he like really dropped in. But his presence was there the whole time. Yeah. And I think that's a real testament to like Harris as well as an actor because you know, Bill is powering Dolby every step of the way. This one inciting incident that happens at the beginning has to be the engine behind the whole series. And of course, so many things happen along the way and Dolby's going through a whole sort of coming to terms with what happened that, was it six years ago? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, with them. But Bill powers the whole thing. And I think, I don't know, Harris left this real presence mm. and yeah, it's just testament to how great he is and crafted that character, even though he was there for like whispers of a moment, you know, um, especially when we were in um, filming in New Jersey. Um, yeah, I could really feel that everything that he poured into the scenes, it was so immense that every time I was harking back to them in all these scenes that were yet to come, it was, I could feel it. I didn't have to try and dig for it. He was there. I know exactly what you mean because I once snuck onto Brit's set because you know when we weren't directing we would be at home sleeping or shot listing or whatever and I snuck onto Brit's set and I was just watching from very far away like some crew member had it on an iPad and it was Harris dying that you guys just watched and it brought tears to my eyes like that's how real it was it was it was an amazing thing and how real you made it by how Darby reacted to watching the, like just coming back together with the love of her life after the seven year or six year separation. And then the moment you found that person again, you're losing them. And how do you, how do you perform that sense of loss and shock and to see yeah, that chemistry, so many times meet that, those kinds of moments. That chemistry was amazing. Yeah. What did that feel like from the inside? <laughs> from the inside. Um, Hot. <laughs> He's a very, Harris is a very open person. My mom has this expression, which I love, which she's just started using to describe people, where she says they have no edges. And I love that. And he truly has no edges. There is no ego. And he's just there and he's open and he's, yeah, which makes him such an amazing person to act opposite because he's so receptive to it and then can just, as you say, there's something really natural and instinctive to the way he responds. It's not pre-planned or, you know, it's, yeah, it's incredible. And I think that because of that openness and because of the way that we, I think, have very similar senses of humor and we got on so well, very organically, and we've become such good friends, we'll be a friend for life. And I think that was so integral to, you know, the building of this entire, this entire show. And especially in those like flashback moments, it was really easy to sort of fall into that rapport with him, yeah. Because it's the haunt of his, it's funny, people often ask me, like, why did you need to break this love story? Like, couldn't you have done Darby's origin story and the coroner's daughter and stuff, but why did it need to be a love story? And I think it's because Zalna were trying to scratch after this feeling we all have right now, this kind of melancholy thing that something is lost, like some love is missing. And your first love sort of becomes a metaphor for that, but it's even in the present, it's like, Darby feels like she's missing something, and that absence that he felt when Harris is gone is a, it's a part of it. I think we're all groping for something that we feel we've lost, and we know technology is a part of it. I mean, we know it's also how we all do what we're doing, and without technology, I, mean, I wouldn't even be a filmmaker. Like, the fact that Final Cut Pro and prosumer cameras happened at the time when I was coming of age in college, it's like why I can do what I do. So it, it's not from a place of being phobic of technology, it's more like, there's something that we're giving up and we're not getting back and we can all feel it, that something is like ebb, ebbing away. Um, and I think the sense of haunt that Bill leaves in the story is like a part of trying to articulate that feeling that we're a bit haunted, yeah. And it, it does make it for, it's really poignant to be able to watch the two of them have their first love. And it, it's impossible not to think of all of ours, you know, when he writes, you know, this is both too much and, and not enough. I mean, that's so, and it, 
I think another, I, I believe this is in a later episode, um, when you kind of walk in and meet each other in person and for the first time in that Frank Ocean Moon River plays, and it's like, that wasn't even a song when I had my first boyfriend, but you still, it's like it just puts you right, right back into it. Um, I wanted to ask, how do you decide who's going to direct each episode? I mean, I guess on this round, we were initially just trying to be like, well, which episodes is Lee in the least, oh, okay. and I will direct those. And then somehow that series of way of dividing things didn't work by the time we got into chapter six, but it did work for the beginning, and it was still really hard. I mean, when we did that dinner scene where you meet Andy and you meet Lee and you meet all these characters and there's so many introductions happening and then Bill comes in and sits down and they haven't seen each other in something. We did that entire 12 page scene with Clive's huge monologue in a day. So we were just like flying through setups and it was very hard to be in that scene and like running in heels to get behind the monitor and watch a version of it and running back. But we had an incredible team and really good collaborators and we did have the good sense to save scenes like that towards the end. So. We managed to and Britt had to set the tone for this one so that she had, like the pilot, there was no question. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. And um, we're, we're basically out of time, but I wanted to, for something I really wanted to ask you guys, which maybe is like a, not an easy, quick question for the end, um, but how, if you could pinpoint in one way, a way that you were most changed by the experience of um, making this, whether in yourself or something that you learned that you're going to use um it won't make you to talk about your next project that you're working on but like you know whether it's a technique or something that you honed or something that you thought about you're going to think about differently or just what what's like still with you um from the <laughs> this should have been that's it that's it that's a deep cut <laughs> zeef and i know you've got you look like you're cooking up I just know that whenever I was stuck with directing a scene, I we would just put a 60 millimeter lens on the camera and put do Emma's close up first, and Emma would do this amazing performance, and that would then guide. Then I would move <laughs> to Charlotta, like okay, now we can figure out the scene. But of course, we'd already been on the wrong side of the line, so then we you know, <laughs> had to work back retroactively. But that was a nice guiding light, and I, I came to really rely on that, so thank you, Emma. <laughs> I had no idea about that. Um, God, you said something earlier as well about how we, you know, being in New York and all living with this, we, what do we say? Something about me growing, <laughs> which I was going to link it back to. Oh, how it's like Darby's coming of age, and you feel like you saw me come of age, and I think that that is... I really feel that as well. I've been quite nostalgic recently, as you say, Britt. It feels like the world's in a weird place and we're longing for something we can't quite put our finger on to make us make sense of ourselves and what's going on. And when I look back on that year, I suppose, as it sort of ended up as, I really look back on it as like a real fundamental shift from a sort of younger person to someone who really had to sort of, to lead a show is a really huge thing. And I don't think I'd really, I didn't really understand what that was before I did this, but you, it was a huge responsibility and I was fortunate enough to be surrounded by amazing people who helped show the way, but yeah, it was a lot of, a lot of lessons learned in like stamina and preparation and the tools you need to do a show like that and um, to carry a character through to the end and do her justice because it's such an immense character. But I think it also set the bar really high for parts that I look for now. Like I've, this, your writing is incredible. The person you've created here, really, there is like, there's so few parts out there like that, sadly, and I, hopefully more, because now you've put her out there and people, you, you can lead by example, but yeah, I think that, yeah, in all those ways. It's, it's, it just feel like there's a, there's an appetite for a chapter two um, mm. of Darby. Mm. Well, the president of FX is here in the audience. <laughs> after her. That's what the reception is for. And, you know, to say to, to that president of FX, speaking of things that we're taking away, I, rem I never have I been on a shoot so hard in my life. And Saul and I have done quite a few crazy, ambitious things, like talking 16-foot octopuses and all the rest. 
But this was so hard because we were in the middle of COVID and we kept going down and getting sick and we were in the middle of a climate crisis and we were being battered by storms. And then I got hypothermia, like severe hypothermia on an IV in a remote mountain hospital, you know, with like toes that didn't work and like throwing up all over the floor. And I remember calling Gina Bailey and the president of FX and I was just like, Gina, straight up, I don't think we can keep going. Like there's just way too much down at this point. Like we are like, we are a ship at sea and we are taking on so much water that not only are we not gonna reach the port, but we're gonna take everybody down with us. Like this is the and it was really amazing to work with a group of people where Gina was just like, we're gonna figure this out, we got this. And we just kept patching up this ship as we were sailing in a time when there was a supply shortage and there was like no copper to build the hotel and the wood was four times the price. And there was a global shortage of production accountants. So we couldn't even hire anybody to keep track of the spending. I mean, it was like your worst fucking nightmare. And somehow Gina and John, like we all just held on together. And I actually think that that, the crisis out of which it was made did enter the footage. Like it, what, Darby was in crisis, the hotel was in crisis, the world we're all in right now is in crisis. And something about that energy did make something honest and, and true and pure have to come out of it. Cause it was like being in a, in a crucible. Um, and it was a real testament to our partners that they they saw the way for us to keep going and we did all keep going and and I think the belief in the show as well yeah like it had such a soul and I think that was felt by everyone who was involved with it in it and even if we were yeah hypothermia on a frozen lake or like in the canyon freezing and also the mad bit about your hypothermia story when you're telling me which is sort of a good analogy for how the show sort of pulled us through everything was the fact that when you came back and you started feeling really odd yeah. and you were like maybe this is hypothermia but surely not in the show darby gets hypothermia and you guys had written that she immediately her instinct when she comes into the room is to um get into a hot bath and ray stops her and says no you have to warm your insides first and didn't you I stop did yourself from getting in the shower yeah. and you i was in my bed like shaking like a jackhammer and i was like i know i'll just get in the shower and i turned it on and the hot water was coming and i was like wait Ray tells Darby and she's like, don't warm the extremities first. And I like reached over to my bedside table and I called my assistant and I was like, oh my God, is there a medic that's awake right now? And the medic came and I threw up all over her. Uh, and she was like, we're going to the hospital. Uh, so yeah, that's a good, that's a good one for, on Ray. Yeah, we did right by Ray. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> still then really kismet that also then the show releases while the industry is in a bit of its own crisis. It really, but like, look at, we're all- You didn't catch a break. I know. <laughs> <laughs> we're all here and able to watch it together now and y'all are able to talk about it. Um, so I think it it seems to have all worked. Um, but thank you all so much for- Thank you, thank you guys.